It's been less than a week since protests against the death of George Floyd at the hands of an agent of the white supremacist state broke out. A lot has been happening, and it's hard to know exactly what to call it. Protests is an okay word because it's very vague, though I might call what's going on an uprising. Whatever it is, there are some pretty clear lessons that we can take from just this short period. I, and many of you, already learned these principles before this week, but we've seen great examples of important lessons for understanding politics, especially U.S. politics. So, let's get started. Number one, you cannot hold the police accountable. Protests began peacefully enough, but it didn't take long for Minneapolis Police Department to show it was not interested in peace. We've seen the state beat, shoot, gas, and run over peaceful protesters. Not just this week, of course, but every time black, brown, and indigenous people protest. The state would rather use violence than hold one of its agents accountable. Police will occasionally fire or suspend its members for something if it gets enough publicity, but the system itself always remains intact. Neither will the police arrest KKK, neo-Nazis, or other fascists, presumably because of how many of them are the same people. But if you want justice, you get the tear gas and the flash grenades and the rubber bullets. That's how power works. You know the phrase, with great power comes great responsibility? Whoever said that first was full of shit. Power necessarily means avoiding responsibility. Why do you think states have such huge, well-funded, well-equipped police and militaries to defend their actions and their interests when their victims fight back? Holding the powerful accountable by conventional means, is pure fantasy. These episodes should also put to bed the myth of the good cop. Because if there were good cops, they would be arresting the violent ones. Number two. There is no peaceful or political solution. You can always tell a state's priorities by comparing its responses to different events. Remember when Hurricane Katrina left all those people stranded in New Orleans and it took, what, a week or something to mobilize the National Guard? And yet black people protest and the National Guard fly into action. Helping black people? Yeah, I'll get round to it someday. Hurting black people? I'm in. Black and indigenous people have been protesting the violence of the white settler state for a long time. They've been subject to injustice every day of their lives for centuries. And, and yet they've tried the respectable, acceptable, polite, and civilized political system. It sucks them up and spits them out again. They've tried peaceful protest of every possible kind. They get attacked or, at best, ignored. No matter how hard they've tried to play the game, none of the causes of their problems have been addressed. Oh, sure, there's, there are occasional firings and quote-unquote reforms, but it's obvious to look at the conditions they live under, there's been no change. That's because the political machine resists change at every step, in all kinds of ways. And right now, we're seeing them all. We're seeing media distort the facts running various contradictory narratives that usually take away all the agency from the people involved. They divide people into groups, like good black people who are engaging in peaceful protest and outside agitators who've hijacked these protests. This move puts a seal of approval on the harmless people, and anyone the state uses violence against, it can just say, oh, but they were outside agitators. It makes it sound like black people don't have it so bad. There are just a few radicals stirring them up. They can't figure out fighting back for themselves. 
everything the media say aims at delegitimizing these protests. So if you're still learning to recognize propaganda, keep your ears open. They report the police's words as facts and don't interview anyone on the ground. We're seeing feigned sympathy from politicians and police. We're seeing token gestures. The killer cop charged with third-degree murder. What's that? And even that was probably more for his own sake, so they could put him in protective custody. In the past, they've relied on so-called reforms, like sensitivity training, racially diverse departments, and community engagement. And they still kill black people with impunity. But hey, maybe they're just one reform and a new police commissioner away from changing forever. I hope you don't believe that. Number three, right-wingers always side with authority. I know some of you are thinking that's a tautology. Being conservative or fascist implies you side with authority by definition. But it's worth underlining. They side with the police and the police protect them. A lot of them are white people with money and a lot are just really confused. Millions of these people lap up everything Trump says without question. They tend to believe everything they're told if the source has in some time in the past told them what they wanted to hear, rather than rigorously looking for evidence or weighing claims by how plausible they sound. You can see it on, on any of their posts, but check out this one from yesterday. So on Facebook and Twitter, you might know, Donald Trump says uh, he's going to declare Antifa a terrorist organization. Okay. Uh, well, it's not actually an organization, and of course the word terrorist is just a meaningless propaganda term. But his supporters are delighted. Let's take a look at some of the stuff they say. <laughs> Thank you, it's about time. Oh, they're so dangerous. <laughs> uh, let's see. You'll see a lot of these comments, a lot of them, are blaming George Soros. George Soros should be declared an enemy of the state and brought up on charges of trying to incite a civil war on American soil using American citizens for his hate-filled ideals against humanity. <laughs> okay. Sure, lady. <laughs> Anyone financing their cause should be held accountable, too. See, it's always, uh, you know, it's always Soros, this shadowy cabal, you know, where they're, who's, who's uh, you know, financing all this stuff. Hopefully the celebrities who collect to bail them out of jail are also so charged with supporting terror. Is there room in Gitmo? Wow. Wow, indefinite detention for anyone bailing people out of jail. <laughs> Why isn't Soros in prison? He's behind all this. He's helping in the destruction of our great country. And so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. Oh, dear. <clears throat> See... They're delighted because they, they want to preserve the racial disparities, preserve their relative privileges, however small they are. They don't give a shit about poor people, black people, indigenous people, or anyone to their left. As long as I've been following them, there has been a very clear contempt for all those people and their freedom to express themselves. The smarter, richer, conservative types support and rely on the system for the relative material benefits it offers them. Working class right-wingers have learned to love the system because it provides them with their identity. Their beloved symbols like 
flags and pledges, the constitution, monuments, the founding fathers, are symbols of states and their effects, like colonialism, slavery, and genocide. They join fascist organizations like the Proud Boys and Patriot Prayer, because those are the people who want to preserve the white supremacist state in all its violence. Like I mentioned in my video, The Illusion of Control, people love to think one evil mastermind or a shadowy cabal is behind everything that isn't business as usual. So these easily brainwashed people line up to say George Soros is behind it all. Okay, presumably Soros is one of the main bad guys because he's Jewish. There are plenty of really rich people funding right-wing media and militias, but I bet you can't name any of them. Soros is a liber liberal capitalist, not a socialist, but he funds liberal causes, and these right-wingers don't know the difference. They think Antifa is an organization for the same reason. They don't know about spontaneous and decentralized direct action, just hierarchical organizations funded by rich people directing people's movements. They simplify and narrow everything down so it fits into their worldview. They want to know who's in charge of Antifa. It's no one. Same with Black Lives Matter. They think of it as a centralized organization funded by Soros. They, they call it BLM because they can't bring themselves to say Black Lives Matter. And they label every protest BLM. That keeps things simple. They don't have to spare any sympathy. Then to make things even simpler, a lot of them will call BLM terrorists too. To them, everyone they disagree with, including peaceful protesters, is so bad they should be treated with extreme force and have no legal recourse. They can't bear to be inconvenienced. Anyone who rocks this rickety old boat deserves punishment. These people are the problem just as much as police or politicians. By the way, if the state treats opposition to fascism as terrorism, what kind of state is it? Anyway, number four, an uprising does not need a vanguard. It's commonly believed on the left that a revolt, a revolution, anything like that, could not possibly succeed without clear leaders. This uprising was not started or led by leaders, anyone specific, or organizations, or a vanguard party who are properly educated in revolutionary principles. There are ad hoc leaders, sure, but no hierarchical organization with the smartest people at the top ready to take power. This movement doesn't even seem to have a coherent philosophy. The people on the ground may or may not have their own ideology, but as I explained in my last video, self-defense doesn't require one. Uprisings can be spontaneous. You just need enough people aware of the problem. In this case, black and brown people in the US were well aware they lived under the thumb of a white settler state that could kill them with impunity. They tried peaceful protest and working through the system, which white people said they would accept, but they didn't. So why continue to wait for white people's approval, or for white people themselves to dismantle systems of oppression and equality that they benefit from marginally? Why not solve the problem directly? And that's what they're doing. And of course, white people are helping. It's a rainbow coalition. Just Take a back seat. Hmm? Let black, brown, and indigenous people of color lead. I think those are the four lessons that had to be said today. What have you learned or confirmed from observing this past week? Let us know in the comments. Keep up the pressure, friends.